Yes. Um, and tonight we're going to be talking about amateur radio and their Internet of Things. Uh, just to talk my, about myself for just 90 seconds so you guys kind of understand where I'm coming from this. Uh, I got my BS in mechanical engineering and at the same time was hacking on computer stuff and networking stuff and electronic stuff. And so during my undergrad, I got my amateur radio license, which I'll talk about that a little bit. I then transferred to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, the real Cal Poly, for um, my master's degree. I lasted as a master's in mechanical for two weeks, had one meeting with my grad advisor. He managed to sufficiently annoy me with what they wanted for the curriculum there that I'm like, ah, screw it, let's switch to electrical engineering. So that happened. I switched to electrical engineering. During my time at Cal Poly, I got real involved with the amateur radio club there, the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club. It's a fantastic collegiate amateur radio club. And I got so involved in it that I actually ended up doing my master's thesis on amateur radio. So I did my master's thesis on the automatic packet reporting system, which I will also talk to you about tonight. After that, I graduated, got a job at a solar cell startup in the South Bay. After about a year, I realized that solar cell startups are a really bad idea. Um, so I then switched to, I now work at LAM Research, which is one of those companies that the people that are in the semiconductor fabrication equipment industry are in, insulted when I explain what LAM does, and the people that are not in semiconductor fabrication equipment have no idea who LAM is. <laughs> LAM Research makes, our, our flagship product is we make wafer plasma etch equipment. So we sell our tools to Intel for seven digits, and Intel uses them to make integrated circuits, right? And so we have customers like Intel and Samsung and Micron and TSMC, right? We, we sell to the fabs to make the chips that all of you use in everything else. So super fun, super awesome, because we're always, like when Intel announces the cutting edge technology node, we spent two years developing it. Um, and we're hiring, so this is my shameless plug right now, that if you want a job in the cutting edge of semiconductor fabrication equipment, talk to me afterwards. Cool. All right, in my spare time, I play with amateur radios, uh, I climb towers, so if you actually want an amateur to come climb your tower, I do that as well. Um, <laughs> it's just like rock climbing, except it's just 120 feet straight up, um, and I don't trust rock. That just kind of freaks me out, like it's, that mountain's been there for a million years, who knows it's gonna fall off right now. Um, I also do all sorts of networking stuff and various uh, other shenanigans, which I write about on my blog, blog.thelifeofkenneth.com, which fairly well documents the life of Kenneth, who is me. So tonight, we're gonna, this talk is gonna be in two parts. The first half, we're gonna talk about what amateur radio is and why it exists. And so if you already have an amateur radio license, I apologize, the first half of this talk is gonna be a little bit boring but we're gonna bring everyone up to know what amateur radio is. And in the second half, we're gonna talk about the automatic packet reporting system. So if you already have an amateur radio license, I hope the second half will inspire you to be interested in APRS. And if you paid attention in the first half and get really excited, the second half will be maybe a little bit over your head, but maybe we'll just get you more, that much more excited to get your amateur radio license. Um, and that's it. Like I just really wanna get you guys interested and do something with radios. Uh, the rules of engagement tonight are going to be relatively simple. Um, if you've got a question, raise your hand. We'll interrupt my presentation. Everyone will focus on you. You will ask your question. I will then attempt to make some snarky remark that includes an answer to your question. Perfect? Cool. All right, so let's, before we talk about amateur radio, let's talk about the FCC. Because what is a better thing to start a talk with than a federal organization? So the Federal Communications Commission is part of the federal government that regulates every, it, I mean, the definition is it regulates interstate communications. And f for what we care about, they regulate every radio frequency emission that comes out of everything. And that's a really good deal because radio emissions are one of those things that it only takes one person to screw it up for the rest of them. Every radio emission falls into some category of what the FCC cares about, all of them. And so even when you don't know what the FCC is and when you don't think about the FCC, the FCC is involved in everything in your day-to-day -day life, right? So for example, when you use Wi-Fi, the reason that Wi-Fi exists 
is because the FCC has allocated specific little chunks of frequencies that are garbage frequencies that they don't really care about and can be used for what it's called industrial, scientific, or medical applications, the ISM band, um, for crazy stuff like wafer plasma etch tools. <laughs> um, and they figure at the same time, eh, we could have some Wi-Fi stuff on there because who the hell cares about consumers? They, you know, they don't get, they don't pay millions of dollars to the FCC. And so when you use Wi-Fi, it's actually on what's called a Part 15 license, where there is no license issued for it, but you can use it. Fantastic. That's also why there's regional codes for like when you leave the country, you have to switch your supposed to switch your Wi-Fi off of the U.S. Because just as there's the FCC, there is the same thing in other countries with slightly different rules. Right, so that's why that exists. You now understand that drop down on your Wi-Fi router. Other parts of Title 47 would be Part 95, which is your citizens band radio, so your CB back in the 90s and truckers, your uh, family radio service blister pack radios. Um, and these, the Part 95 radios, they are, the license is type certified to the specific device. And so to use a Part 95 license radio, you don't have to get a license yourself, but you have to get hardware that is specifically designed for Part 95, which is why you go to Fry's, you buy that blister pack radio, and then you can use that. Part 90 is commercial, um, which is where I actually spend most of my uh, free time playing with radio stuff is on Part 90 commercial radio, and that's your police, your taxi. So if you watch taxis driving by and you look on the top of the roof, you'll see this little steel antenna that's about 17 inches long that's their Part 90 dispatch radio that they use to talk back to Central Command, right? So when you see the taxis driving by, look for it. It's super fun. Um, and then finally, there's Part 97, which is the title, part of Title 47, that defines amateur radio. Um, the formal definition of amateur radio is uh, relatively verbose. So if you really care about this, you could, should go pull up Title 47, Part 97, because we all do that sort of thing in our free time. Um, but pretty much it comes down to amateur radio exists as a way to license people to play with radios, right? This is for learning. This is for education. This is for uh, global outreach. This is for getting people familiar with radio operation, electronics, building things with their hands, which is essentially the same mandate for places like Hackaday. Um, it's just that it predates the maker movement by the better part of 100 years. Right, and so this was really the, the, the sort of stuff that got me interested in amateur radio is that it encourages you to do the same sort of stuff that we all already do because we're excited about learning. So pretty much what it comes down to is when you get an amateur license, the FCC says, all right, you have proven yourself to be worthy to have the permission of the federal government to on certain specific frequencies transmit at certain power levels beyond what you can do as a normal citizen and use that for one of the stated objectives of amateur radio. And there's a lot of them. The amount of radio spectrum allocated to amateur use is worth billions of dollars just because this learning and education and outreach is that valuable, right? And so if you're interested in studying ionospheric propagation, you can get down in the lower frequencies, down in the ones of megahertz, and you can play with that. If you're interested in ultra high data rate point to point radios, you can do that as well, because we've got licenses up in the 400 megahertz, 900 megahertz, all the way up to effectively daylight. We have licenses for it. And that's all under this one license. We get permission for all of this. It's great, right? And so. This is really quite unprecedented because most other licenses, like for a taxi company, a taxi company gets a license for exactly one frequency or one pair of frequencies in a specific region. Whereas an amateur, I get a license for whole ranges of frequencies in the continental US, right? And so it's a very relaxed, hands-off, light touch sort of experience where once I got my license, I don't interact with the FCC that much and then all I do is stay within the rules of this license and learn. We're just going to take a drink, drink real quick. So what can you do with amateur radio? Right, so as I've been preaching, one of the things you can do with it is you can build your own radio transceivers. 
And this is something that's actually quite remarkable. Um, because most people, when you're building, like, when you're doing like a little microcontroller and then you plug one of those radio modules on top of it, that part 15 module is conceivably type certified just for the module and you're not really supposed to go down to the discrete level of building the individual amplifiers and chunks of that radio transceiver um, because to do that you need some sort of license and you need to make sure that it's within some limits. And the ISM limits are really pretty prohibitive. Like, like you're limited to four watts and you're limited to certain antenna gains where when you're building a radio for yourself for amateur radio and the ceiling on my permissions for what I can have come out of this radio is one and a half kilowatts, which will kill you, um, and I get huge chunks of spectrum, if my power is a little bit higher than I meant to or I'm a little bit off of frequency, um, it's much more forgiving. And there's this whole culture in amateur radio of promoting this sort of stuff. Of course you would build your own radio. That's, what, that's the sort of thing that amateurs do. And so, um, as a specific citation, I love this book by H uh, Wes Hayward, The Experimental Methods in RF Design. So if you're interested in building your own radio, get this book. In the first chapter, he has you cobble together a radio with like two integrated circuits and a few discrete parts. And then each chapter is, let's take this block in the block diagram and spend 40 pages learning everything about that one. Um, so at the beginning of it, you have this like little thing, like you can get like the pixie kits on eBay that are $7 and it's a set like the bare bones minimum for a radio transceiver. And by the end of it, you have the equivalent of like a six or $700 communications transceiver. So it's a really fun book if you want to get into RF analog design stuff. You can also talk to other amateurs, which I don't do that much. And this is kind of, I would say the big downside to amateur radio. Um, amateur radio has existed for the better part of 100 years, uh, which means that the culture for it is a little aged. Um, the demographics at amateur radio clubs tend to be a little rough, and so if you show up at a amateur radio club meeting as like a college student, and you're the only person there under 50, I commiserate with you. That is a very common experience for uh, people that show up at amateur radio clubs, is it tends to be a lot of old white men, which are... They're great. Um, <laughs> you, you can learn a lot from them. Uh, but it's a, it's a little taxing on the karma. Um, <laughs> old white men in the audience, you guys are great. I love you. You're, you're fantastic. <laughs> um, that being said, um, you don't have to talk to other hams because getting your license is so easy, you can take your current friends get them licensed, and then you can just talk to them instead. Um, so like for one example, Burning Man. Well, I guess it's, it's different now because like apparently there's cell phone coverage at Burning Man now, which is crazy, but boo, right. Uh, but a couple years ago, I go to Burning Man, um, and a few people showed up with family radio service, which are part 95 radios, so you don't need a license to use them but everyone showed up with part 95 radio, so they were unusable because everyone was trying to use the same frequencies. With amateur radio, we get huge spans of frequencies, so I picked some frequency at random, and all of my friends and I got to then talk to each other all week over high-powered handhelds that were like an order of magnitude better than the FRS garbage, um, and I was able to communicate all week, right? So amateur radio, should not only be thought of as its own hobby, think of it more as a means to some other ends that you want to accomplish. So if you want to have a communication solution at Burning Man, amateur radio is fantastic. If you want to use, if you want to experiment with RF amplifier design, amateur radio is a great way to give you a means to do that. If you want to use amateur radio to support athletic events, that's also a great thing to do. And that's another one of the things I love about amateur radio is I use it to support athletic events. Um, one specific example is I help support the Wildflower Triathlon, and this is a whole other talk that I give. Um, the Wildflower Triathlon is a triathlon out in the middle of nowhere, South Monterey County. And there is one cell phone tower there, and the event weekend, we have 30,000 people there 
kind of sounds like Burning Man, right? Um, everything melts down, no one can make any phone calls, it doesn't work. But since amateur radio is on our own frequencies, we actually help support the event. And so I got to get on the behind the scenes of doing you know, event promotion and production stuff because of my amateur radio license, using it to solve someone else's problems, which is communications and logistics during an event. Right, and so on the left there, I am coordinating all of the aid stations between um, along like a 100, 100 mile bike ride. And then this is two of my friends who are now married, I guess, um, on motorcycles. Uh, so they were actually chasing the lead bicyclists on the triathlon going like 35 miles an hour for 57 miles. Um, and so they were able to tell us in uh, race command exactly where everyone was. And if someone got injured, the hams call it in, say, hey, there's, you know, there's an injury at this mile marker. And then in race command, as amateurs, I actually got to then dispatch an ambulance to go scoop them up off the road, right? And like, where else do you get to do that sort of awesome thing than as get, getting a license like this that gives you the latitude to be able to get into these sorts of events, right? And so there's tons and tons of these sorts of different things that you can do with amateur radio that is not the classic, let's sit in front of a radio and talk to other amateurs about how great your radio is um, because, you know, the conversations on local repeaters tend to not be that exciting and I'm not that extroverted to want to be able to talk to people anyways. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I want you to definitely think about amateur radio as a means to other ends. So, I've, I've now talked to you for 15 minutes about how great amateur radio is, and you're thinking to yourself, all right, I want to get an amateur radio. I'm ready to go down this long, sordid path. I'm going to go pull out my sword and do battle with the Federal Communications Commission and, you know, beat that dragon. It's super easy. You find a local testing station. We're in the Bay Area, so there's almost, there's one almost every single weekend. So you go on online. The American Radio Relay League is the um, lobbyist organization for amateurs, and they have got a great website that has a testing location, like a testing locator. You put in your zip code and you see, hey look, there's a test session this weekend, there's a test session next weekend, there isn't one the weekend after that, so you'll have to wait three weeks to, to go to the next one. You take a 35 question multiple choice test, and this test is asking stuff like, you know, do you understand that you have to stay within these frequencies the FCC told you you have to stay in? Do you understand that you have to be kind to each other and that you can't say inappropriate things on the radio? Real basic, like, I think there's maybe one question about do you understand Ohm's Law? And the thing is, it's 35 questions drawn from a pool of 350 questions. They give you all the questions beforehand. And so studying for this test, I would say, is relatively easy. There are people online that will bemoan that, well, back in my day, I had to take a written test and test on Morse code. Yeah, there's no Morse code test anymore. You don't need to learn Morse code. But once you get your amateur license, you can learn Morse code, because Morse code's kind of cool and awesome. But you don't have to. So once you pass the test with at least a 75% score, um, you hand in all your paperwork, and depending on how good the test proctors are, somewhere in the range of one week to several weeks later, you'll get your call sign, and at that point, you're set. You can go on Amazon, or like, well, I guess up in Oakland, there's still one retail store that you can buy amateur radios. Um, once, your, once your license shows up in the database, you then can be an amateur, right? And being an amateur is great. Um, and so, what a call sign is, is this is the authorization string that identifies me as someone who has passed said tests. So for example, my amateur call sign is W6KWF, um, which fortuitously is my initials because I paid extra. <laughs> um, it's also my license plate because it turns out in California, once you have an amateur license, it's a single $20 fee to get license plates of your call sign. <laughs> and since my call sign's my initials, my Truck's license plate is my initials, and my registration is the same as all you schmucks. <laughs> so, um, in the FCC uh, 
license database, you can say call sign W6KWF, radio service, HV, which is I'm an amateur who got a vanity license because I'm vain, apparently. Um, and then the other thing is it says that I'm an amateur extra. There is three tiers of amateur licenses. When you go to pass that first 35 question test, you are a technician class amateur. Once you go take another 35 question test, which is a little bit harder, you become a general. And then once you pass another 50 question test, which actually is legitimately kind of hard for a multiple choice test, you then can become an amateur extra. All that general and amateur extra gets you is additional privileges below 50 megahertz, which is exclusively used for over the horizon, long range, like I'm gonna go talk to South America or Europe sort of communications. Um, I'm big into networking and local communications for events and talking to my friends at Burning Man, in which case HS HF is of no value to me. I'm also a millennial, so I live in an apartment with lots of switch mode power supplies, which put out HF noise, so HF is also of no value to me. Because if I were to fire up an HF radio in my apartment, all I would hear is <laughs> everywhere. So if you, if you were to only get a technician class license and then play with amateur radio forever, I would not judge you because that's perfectly fine. Are there any questions on getting your amateur license? So after you get, after you get your technician license, um, the first thing you would want to do is you wanna, want, you'd want to buy a handheld radio. Um, Baofeng is the new Chinese cheap knockoff hotness. Um, Yezu and Kenwood are the two brands that make like the, well, Yezu, Kenwood, and Icom, I guess I should mention the third one. Um, Yezu, Kenwood, and Icom make really nice handheld radios. You're expected, you're, you should expect to spend about $150 in your first handheld. The Baofeng Chinese ones are about $50. Um, for your first radio, I won't hold it against you for buying that first uh, Chinese knockoff. Um, and then uh, in each area, you can look up uh, the local repeaters, which are these boxes that sit on mountaintops that t people tend to hang out on the frequencies for it. So you can look up those frequencies and talk to other hams locally. Um, or you and your friends can pick a simplex frequency, just one channel, and talk to each other on that. Right. Um, and so that's the, what you would do after that. And then from there, you've got a thousand different options, uh, depending on exactly what you want to get into in amateur radio. All right, great. So that was the first half of my talk, getting you guys excited about amateur radio. Now, we're going to go from my first radio and getting your license all the way down to I did my master's thesis on this. <laughs> so if you were bored for the first half because you already have an amateur license, pay attention now, wake up. Um, for the rest of you, I'm going to try not to lose you. Even though you heard about amateur radio 20 minutes ago, I'm going to try and keep this interesting. Now we're going to talk about the automatic packet reporting system. Back in the 80s, uh, back when dial-up modem internet was, the new hotness was 2400 baud, amateurs decided to build this nationwide packet network. Um, because when you dialed into the internet, it tied up your phone line. And amateurs have radios that go about as far as a local phone call. And so they took the 1200 baud modems that were then being sold off because everyone was upgrading to 2400 baud and they built this awesome packet network to let you send and receive messages at 1200 bits per second which was only one tier down from the new hotness on the internet one of these networks that they built um, and it, it kind of has evolved over the last 30 years is called the automatic packet reporting system and what it is is it's a it's a, a worldwide network, but in the US, it's all on one frequency. It is a message passing protocol that lets you exchange short strings of text with others that are nearby you, or through internet gateways, get them onto the internet and conceivably pass those messages with other people. And this is where the buzzword compliance of Internet of Things comes in on my talk, because short message passing protocol suspiciously sounds like stuff like MQTT or any other you know, new sensor Internet of Things thing. Um, it's a 1200 bit and 1200 baud system, which is relatively slow, so you're not gonna be able to transfer files over this network, 
But what you can do is basic, you know, every 10 minute telemetry or every five minute, you know, updates or text messages. SMS is great over this network. And even if you are building a low power, like little handheld node or transceiver for this network, on volunteers have set up on mountaintops what are called digipeters, which listen on this frequency and repeat them at higher power. And so from right here, even if I were to only use like a two or five watt signal, I can cover the entire Bay Area with one of these packet message messages. P vo other volunteers also run internet gateways that listen on this frequency, capture every single packet, and feed it into this online data stream of here are all of the packets worldwide on the APRS network. And so if I was interested in beaconing data and having it be captured to go online, and then I've got some server somewhere else listening for it, I can do that. And this is all done on the amateur frequencies, so you have to be licensed, but it's all done for free. So if you don't want to give Chris Gamble's company Hologram money, you can instead use this for that same sort of, you know, under one megabyte a month sort of data transfer with the limitation that amateur doesn't let you make money. Is it's, a non, it's strictly non-commercial, and so if you were to start a business on this, you'd have to move off of the amateur frequency, right? But if you don't want to pay for a SIM card for your little telemetry node out in the middle of nowhere, this, is ex this would be the sort of system that you'd be interested in. Yeah? So if you're a money-making concern that wants to use the same protocol with a f I'm going to say that there's a few exceptions for there's a couple amateur radi APRS developers that are pretty adamant that they don't want you to use their software for commercial applications. Most of us that develop a APRS software put it under permissive open source licenses. And so if you wanted to get a commercial part 90 license, which is for s some limited part 90 radio licenses is very simple and very easy. It's like $160 in a slightly longer form and no test. Um, right? It's a, literally a form where I filled out, I want to be licensed for myself, 500 of my friends, here is a check for $160, boom, I have a commercial license. Um, and so you could get a commercial license, move to that frequency, and then build the whole system there. Right? So we can, w I can give you as many details about that later. Yeah, so on my license, I put the geographical limit as continental U.S., <laughs> south of line A. So I, I can't operate in the northernmost 30 kilometers up to Canada. So it is geographically limited. I can only operate most of the U.S. Um, but yeah, commercial licenses are geographically limited like that. It's just that um, for what's called an itinerant commercial license, um, there is relatively loose rules on that. Right. So, like I said, um, if you were this little person down there and you were to beacon these digipeters that are listening for your packet would repeat them and then it would propagate outwards. Other people listening on the frequency, like driving in their car, will see your little status update show pop up on their screen as well as it would end up going into the internet system, right? And so, um, a lot of the developers have this dream that APRS will be a you know, RF only sort of system, but uh, realistically, most people are using it to try and get into the internet data stream, and that's perfectly fine. Um, here's an example of one of the trackers. So this is a GPS receiver, a transmitter in a Pelican case, si uh, six AA batteries, you throw it in your dash and you can know where your car is. Because one of the things that you can beacon is your GPS location. So one of my buddies drove, took a road trip, and he turned on the APRS tracker in his car, and so I was able to actually follow him all the way from the Bay Area out to Arizona and back, right? So this is one of the applications. But remember, this is a worldwide network, so why limit yourself to only Southern California and Arizona when you can put this in a weather balloon? And then you can, in live, in real time, know exactly where your weather balloon is as it floats across the world. Um, a couple of these guys have actually put APRS trackers up in balloons that went around like seven, eight, nine times the entire world. It was amazing, right? And so the, the limits on this sort of thing are pretty small, right? You can also do telemetry. 
right? So this is the temperature and dew point from some weather station set up on APRS, right? So you also have that sort of option. Um, a great place to look at this sort of data is APRS.fi. Uh, it's this great guy in Finland who set up this database that he captures all of the APRS traffic on the internet and then puts it on Google Maps like this and plots all the beautiful telemetry like that. Um, so if you are interested in poking around to see what is going on on APRS, APRS FI is a great place to look there. Um, so if you want to go out and start playing with APRS after getting your amateur radio license, um, it's a rel relatively simple protocol at the actual physical layer. It's what's called an audio frequency shift keyed modem. So it's literally a little controller in your modem that plays two tones, 1200 hertz and 2200 hertz. Same actu it's the same modem used on caller ID on landlines because amateurs like to take secondhand stuff like that. Um, and you just hook that, wire that up to some radio that the controller keys the radio then transmits this audio chirp that is the data that you want to pass across it. Um, so there's a couple companies that sell these modems that you can wire up to your radios like Cantronics, Argent Data and Bionics. Um, the Argent Data OT3 is one of my favorite because it's a little box about the deck of size of a deck of cards with screw blocks on the front and you can feed in like zero to 20 volt signals that it then beacons as telemetry. So if you want to monitor like the battery voltage in your car, you could do it with this sort of setup, literally just wire to screw block, wire, uh, wire this up to a radio, turn on radio. It's real, the entry level is pretty low and then you can get all the way into defining your own packet protocol specs because the packet formats are very permissive and very flexible because it's all just human readable text put in a comment field essentially of the packet. And that's it. That's, that's, that's kind of been my 15 minute pitch for why you as an amateur having just gotten your license or have had your license for 10 years and haven't done anything with it would be interested in playing with APRS and VHF packet. So there's my email. You can read my blog. I'm sarcastic on Twitter all the time if you want more of this in your daily feed. Um, are there any questions at this point? Yes. So with all this kind of frequency, um, how do you, like, how, how do you track solution? Are there loops on pairs or mm -hmm. um, send the signal somehow? Or what are the activities? Yeah. So on APRS, if, if it's all in one frequency, how do you prevent collisions and packet loss? You don't. It's all, is it's, it's kind of a, you could say that it's a retry thing, but it's more of a, if I beacon my position every five minutes, and I'm driving down the freeway and you don't, and you lose one of those packets, eh, there'll be a 10 minute gap between two of my positions instead of a five minute gap, right? So a lot of this sort of telemetry data, if you lose half of it, it's not a big deal. Um, the formal answer is that you're supposed to do a carrier sense multiple access uh, protocol on there, but some of the people, some of the transmit, some of the APRS nodes that people implement don't have receivers in them. But again, this is all a, like, you're gonna lose some packets and it's not a big deal. Uh, the SMS like guaranteed delivery text message system in it does do retries. And so there is several disagree, there's several different conflicting standards proposed that none of them got ratified as far as what retry algorithms to use in APRS. But these are amateurs, they're not network designer, network protocol designers, so we do the best we can. Uh, do I happen to know off the top of my head the coverage out in high country, out in the middle of no sticks nowhere? It totally depends on which canyon you're in. Um, is APRS, once you get out of the suburbs and out of the high density population areas, um, it, some, of, some places are really good and some places you get over one magic ridge, li ridge line and you'll have no infrastructure up there. Um, what a lot of people do is they will figure out which ridge line has coverage somewhere else and they'll park a car there or drop like an ammo can with a digipeter in it and fill in the area they're using for camping that weekend. Or you get into other middle of nowhere places like Nevada. Nevada weirdly has like an almost 100% state coverage just because the local amateur community there put a lot of effort and time into designing a really good APRS network. So it, unfortunately it really depends on exactly where you are geographically. 
Yeah, so if you go on APRS.fi and you zoom out, um, once you get beyond a certain zoom out, it actually turns into a heat map. And so you can then see where there's lots of APRS traffic and where there's absolutely no APRS traffic at all. So you can, scrolling around on APRS.fi, you can get a pretty good idea of where there's APRS coverage and where there isn't. Yeah. The licenses are 10-year licenses. Um, the renewal is free. So you literally just have to ping the FCC and say, I am still alive. Um, and I guess I actually have to do that this year. So I need to remember in six months to renew my license. Or it's going to be kind of embarrassing the next time I try and key up and I realize I don't have a license. Yeah, so it's 10 years. Every 10 years, I think you just have to log in to the ULS and fill out some little form and say, I, I'm still interested in having a license. Uh, you first. Yeah, so his question was, um, if all the digit feeders can hear each other, how is it not just loops and pa single packets are sitting there ping-ponging back around forever? Um, there's a time to live counter on it, and so when I beacon a packet, I'll say, I want this to go out two hops, and every digit feeder will decrement it. Um, and there's also a route vector that every digit feeder appends their call sign to it, um, much like, like BGP. Um, and there's also, it's a 30 minute a 30 second deduplication window. So a digipeter will only repeat a packet once every 30 seconds. So when it pongs off the other digipeter, it'll go, I already transmitted this packet and just drop it. So um, it's relatively easy to overload the network just by spewing lots of garbage. Like if you beacon every six seconds, you'll, you will overload the network. Um, but left to its own devices, the network does perform pretty well. And there was one up here. So um, everyone on the APRS system needs to be licensed. Um, and so for every node transmitting, you need to designate some person's amateur license to be the control operator. Um, and so there is someone's call sign attached to the original message. Um, if you're injecting APRS traffic through the internet, um, we actually have a <laughs> comically bad crypto system, which is CRC16. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a CRC16 check some of your call sign that is the magic password to inject packets online so that when some internet gateway gateways your packet onto RF, it's authenticated as this came from a ham. Um, needless to say, CRC16 is not a good crypto algorithm. We're working on fixing that. But, you know, amateurs. <laughs> cool, thank you. <laughs>